All right, uh, there'll be some redundancy in these talks. It's not my fault. Um, when you diagnose a person, we used to be, at, when I was in training, very uh, obsessed with diagnosing uh, people with acute mesenteric ischemia because really the only way to do it was to get an angiogram on them. So it was a big step to take somebody from the ER and angiogram them just on a suspicion that they had mesenteric ischemia. Now everybody who goes to the ER who's not wearing a white coat gets a CAT scan, so it's a little more specific, but you should still know how, we, how you should do it. So mesenteric ischemia obviously can be acute or chronic. The acute people should be complaining only of hours to days of pain, whereas the chronic people will have um, weeks, months, even years of pain if they've been misdiagnosed. Um, women have it more often than men, three to one ratio. But the, important to know, so in the office, the most common referral you'll get is somebody with asymptomatic mesenteric ischemia, and that's because 20% of the elderly population in this country will have some degree of mesenteric stenosis. That does not mean uh, you should treat it. Leave that to those guys in the next room. They can treat the asymptomatic ones. Um, but So usually, if it is symptomatic, it's going to involve multiple <coughs> vessels. It can just involve the SMA, but it's pretty rare. Um, single vessel disease involving the, the celiac or the IMA is almost always asymptomatic. Um, the symptoms are pretty classic. You know them, abdominal pain, food fear, uh, weight loss. Uh, they should be thin, but never underestimate people's ability to eat through pain as well. Um, and physical exam findings are nonspecific. You can hear a brewery, uh, but other than that, very uh, nonspecific. So keep in mind that when you're diagnosing acute, it can often be acute on chronic, so they can have some form of chronic mesenteric ischemia, and then all of a sudden, but something will change. You know, you should look for that sudden change of woke up, all of a sudden I had pain, they can crap themselves, believe it or not, that's an initial presentation, they just have a stool evacuation, not bloody, just reflex stool evacuation, but something should change fairly um, suddenly in the acute onset. Um, and then the pain out of proportion of physical findings is true early on. Later on, when they get true mesenteric ischemia and it becomes irreversible, their physical findings will be uh, there. So embolus versus thrombosis. Uh, embolus means acute, no um, preceding um, symptoms, whereas thrombosis, they'll have this chronic food uh, anxiety, food pain, and then all of a sudden something got worse. That's a much worse situation when we have acute on chronic, when it's thrombosis on top of chronic disease much harder to treat and much worse outcomes. All right, embolus usually spares what? Middle colic, right? So it spares the proximal jejunum. Uh, so it's important that you know the anatomy. So the celiac and the SMA collateralize through what? Through the gastroduodenal artery and through the uh, superior mesenteric, uh, through the arcobular, right? So the important vessel there is the gastroduodenal, and that provides the collateralization to the SMA from the celiac. So if we have a celiac stenosis, something that's somewhat pathognomonic, I don't know if somewhat pathognomonic is a phrase, but somewhat pathognomonic of celiac disease is retrograde flow where? <laughs> Bueller. <laughs> well, yeah, but the arc of Bueller is a little bit hard to see with a duplex, I'm assuming. So the hepatic artery. So if you have retrograde flow in the hepatic artery, that's somewhat pathognomonic of celiac artery disease because you're getting flow from the SMA through the arcobular into the gastroenteral, back through the hepatic artery, usually feeding into the left gastric and the splenic. Cool? All right, sure. All right, SMA and IMA feed through the middle colic over to the left colic. That's the famous arc of virulon and also the marginal artery of Drummond. So if we see those two big collaterals on an angiogram, that's somewhat indicative that there's disease uh, at the origins of one of those vessels and they're collateralizing with each other. IMA also collateralizes the hypogastric, so we don't talk about this one as much, and that's through the superior rectal of the IMA to the middle rectal of the hypogastric, and that's also very important collateralization. Now, when we talk about stent grafts, and we're going to cover this hypogastric and that hypogastric, people tend to screw up the anatomy because they worry about what? If we're going to cover one hypogastric, they look at the other hypogastric, right? But there's actually almost no collateralization between the two hypogastrics. The internal uh, iliac artery, the hypogastric artery, collateralizes from the IMA and also from what? Profunda, exactly. So that's under-recognized, under but that's the real collateralization. So when you're doing an angiogram, you're going to cover the hypogastric. Those are the vessels you really need to look at.
All right, so somebody comes in your office, kind of a chronic complaint. The first thing you're gonna do is get a duplex, right? It's pretty easy, it's right there in your office. Uh, duplex works better when they're fasting. It also works better when they're thin, but hopefully you're not doing a bunch of these on fat people or you probably have the wrong diagnosis, right? So these are the numbers that you need to know. So we've set the numbers at, for greater than 70%, it's very sensitive to look at a peak systolic velocity in the SMA of greater than 275 or greater than 200 in the celiac. So that's to diagnose a lesion greater than 70%. Got it? Good. 50%, we look at the end diastolic velocity, confusingly, and an end diastolic velocity greater than 45 in the SMA or greater than 55 in the celiac is associated with a greater than 50% stenosis. All right, so those numbers pop up on exams and things like that. Uh, also, reverse flow in hepatic artery like we talked about before, right? That indicates celiac stenosis. I know you know it. All right, so this is what the duplex uh, should look like. These are the velocities on your left of the normal, on your right, the abnormal. Uh, the first thing you see is why is the celiac, why is the pattern in the celiac artery so much different than the SMA and the IMA? Liver, right. So there's a few very low resistance bodies uh, in your body. One is the liver, uh, the other is the brain, and the other is the kidneys. So very low resistance bodies give you kind of a, a pattern like that one there whereas the SMA and the IMA have higher resistance. So how would you lower the resistance in the SMA or the IMA? Eat, right? So postprandial, these things change. So right here we see that triphasic flow, um, but after you eat, it becomes much uh, less resistance. So it's a very different exam if you do it postprandial. So now everybody gets a CT angiogram. So this is good for you because it lowers your need to actually diagnose this and we'll let the uh, radiologist do it. So it's the highest spatial resolution is done with CTA. Uh, the advanced CTA over conventional angiographies, it's not invasive and also we can do it and assess the bowel wall. And I'll show you that in a second. We can look at the venous phase and it's pretty quick to get. So air in the liver, air in the bowel wall, indicative of some form of mesenteric ischemia. Uh, the disadvantages are dye, right? Dye, you can get allergic reaction, you can die from it. Uh, the cost, and also there's some difficulty in differentiating calcification from contrast, uh, depending upon which window you use. So MRA, you can do. Uh, however, it's also subjected to uh, calcium artifacts. It takes a lot longer to do an MR than a CT. I don't know if any of you have had an MR, but you have to lie there for quite some time, so it takes a lot longer to do. And the spatial resolution is actually worse. So we don't do a lot of MRA for the diagnosis of this. <coughs> Conventional angiography, this used to be how we had to diagnose somebody from the ER. We'd take them up and do an angiogram on it. Now we mainly do this if we're planning to intervene. Same as lower extremity. You shouldn't be doing a lot of diagnostic lower extremity angiography. And the same is true with mesenteric. This is not used for diagnosis. This is used for treatment. Um, you've already kind of gone over this a little bit, but if you're coming from the groin, you need to use some kind of reverse curve catheter. Your tenings all have one that they do, uh, especially for the SMA because it is a reverse curve. Coming from the arm, it's a much straighter shot. The problem with the arm is a lot of brachial arteries can't tolerate a six French system, so you're going to have a little more trouble if you choose to um, treat them. We do a lot through the arm. Um, sometimes you'll get a thrombosis. It's relatively easy to fix. So if you have no femoral access, don't rule out the arm access just because of size. You can always go in and treat um, small local thromboses, which most of them are with the six French system afterwards. So I know, hopefully you know all this, but to diagnose disease at the origin, you need a lateral angiography. So get their hands above their head and put the catheter up at T12 at, at least, and then you're gonna see both sides. Your injection rate, you just wanna fill the aorta. It's usually 10 cc's per second for two seconds will do the job, and then you can see it. It's important that they hold the breath, otherwise you get all kinds of crazy um, <coughs> distractions. Um, and if you want to diagnose more distal disease, usually with an APVO. Lab studies, you know, uh, albumin should be low in chronic disease. Uh, lately, late on, you'll get lactic acidosis with all the sequela of that, um, but it's really fairly nonspecific, so it's not really something you diagnose by lab values. So it's fairly straightforward. If it's an acute process, they're in your ER, you're gonna get a CTA. If they're in your office, you're gonna get a duplex. So that's why their things are where they are because that's where they're needed. So in your office, you're gonna get a duplex. 
And as I said, 20% of people over 65 have some form of mesenteric stenosis. So be on the lookout for people sent to you with no symptoms because they obviously don't need to be treated. The last thing uh, we're going to talk about is something that people get very confused about as well, and it's celiac compression syndrome. So this is caused by the median arcuate ligament. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about this. Some people believe that the arcuate ligament is just in the right place, and some people get stricture because of when, orientation of the artery, uh, when they breathe, maybe it's nothing, maybe they're crazy. We don't really know. So the things you have to look out for are A, crazy, because there is definitely some psychiatric component to this, because once people are crazy and they have these things and then they get the diagnosis, then they're going to come to you wanting treatment. So look for any kind of psychiatric component to it. Uh, because this is pretty rare, but 25% of people will have a median arcuate ligament that rides anterior to the celiac artery. So the anatomic configuration is common, but the process itself is very rare. So that's a big setup to getting a bunch of your people in your office who have the diagnosis but don't actually have the entity. Um, so that's what it looks like. The arcuate ligament usually is um, a few centimeters above the celiac artery. But in some people, like I said, in 25%, it can actually ride anterior to it, and you get something that looks like this. Um, one thing you can do to kind of elicit it on angiography is inspiration, expiration. So it's exasperated by expiration, right? So that was confusing to me at first because I was thinking more about the lung and how the lung would displace the diaphragm. But if you think of it as the bowel, so as you expire, the bowel goes up into the chest, right? As you expire, the lungs compress, and the bowel comes up. And that's how you get the celiac artery going up, chasing the bowel, and kind of kinks around the median arcuate ligament. But remember, this is a very common entity um, anatomically, but a very rare one physiologically. All right, very good. I'll see you guys in a couple hours. Thanks.